planning. We have two wonderful people. I'd really like it. Please unmute yourselves. I see William's already unmuted himself. And Rachel, please introduce yourselves. Feel free to use your language and acknowledge where you're at. Hello. Good I everyone. Um, my name is William Tillmet. Um, really, it's Pongarda Tillmet. That's my skin name. But um, I'm from Central Australia, Alice Springs, um, right in the heart of Australia, right in the middle. And uh, I'm in my own country, my family's country, which is uh, Central Aranda. I'm Eastern Aranda, which runs all the way towards the Queensland border. Um, but um, I'd like to welcome everyone to. Um, the on the panel and every all the viewers and uh, yeah, let's have a great time. Thank you. Thanks, William. Um, Ula or Ulula Tak, Hovanga Rachel Rene, Nutaka Yel Hok Nanginak Edwardson, Utkara Vimu, um, Apara George Edwardson, uh, Akara Debbie Edwardson, um, Kuyak Barak, Uvlupak, um, and Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, good evening. My name is Rachel Rene, Nutaka Yel Hok Nanginak Edwardson. Um, I'm an Inupak woman from Inupak Norwegian and Sami woman from the northern uh, community in the very northern part of. Alaska and the northernmost tip in Inupak community there. Um, I would like to start off by recognizing the unceded territory of the Wurundjeri people who I'm calling in, whose country I'm calling in from today and, and um, also of the Arendan Gawa people whose brave and courage and thought wisdom brought us this story and film today. Um, and then my own elders and people um, and recognize all elders past and present and um, also pay respects to the elders of everybody in the room and the countries from which you're calling on. Uh, thank you for having us here today. We're really honored to be invited into this uh, from the film team. I'm, the, I'm one of the producers, creative producers on the film and William was one of our key advisors. We made this movie in a very different way in a very collaborative approach to most documentary filmmaking. Um, and so we're, we're very honored to be invited into a space on this particular day to talk about, to talk about these issues and this, this way of working. Thank you so much. That film was full of so many different ideas and things going on that I really have to ask, what is it that led this community and you to to be a part of making this film. William, do you well, want to start? The film itself was um, uh, instigated um, over, over many years. I mean, it didn't just happen in the last three years. It, you know, I think the last 10 years and uh, Rachel and um, Maya, the um, both producers, had become very familiar with the family, had become very familiar with uh, the story they wanted to tell. And um, it was the family who took control. They um, took agency in this. And it's, un it's an unconventional way of d making films. Uh, most people come with scripts and um, sets and uh, a whole film crew and, uh, and away they go. But in, in this regard, it was, uh, as you can see with, um, I think, the opening scene where um, Megan's talking about her children and which one she's, she loves. And actually, it was Duan who was doing the filming. So he took control of the camera and away he went. And uh, it became a very uh, emotional scene in, in regards to uh, uh, the way Megan and her son talked. Um, but the whole film itself was about um, people finding their own solutions, their own uh, way of dealing with things and uh, uh, having agency in their lives, which is something uh, most First Nations people have been denied, is the right to have agency in your life. Everything was prescribed for you, all solutions were prescribed for you. And at the end of the day, they controlled where you lived, 
uh, what money you got, how you lived, and all those sort of where you worked or whether you was permitted to even leave the uh, mission or the reservation in in in, in your cases and it, it was control, control, control. Uh, in this case of the film, the family had control and I think Rachel can uh, talk more on that. Yeah, thank you, William. That's a beautiful way to couch it. I think that's really important and it's important to think about, you know, when we're talking about stories, this film comes out of a desire uh, by the communities to tell an authentic story that is driven from the communities themselves and comes out of a long, long line of work, uh, even multi-generations of work. And really it comes out of the guidance and leadership of elders on the ground who've held that space of, space of strength and resistance to all that control and all the oppression that so many of our communities face. Um, you know, when you look at how things grow in communities, you know, this film is a direct result out of that strength from the from the community themselves and the work um, specifically to tell and place a film in a mainstream context that was in resistance to all of the negative media that we see when we turn on the television. You know, so often you turn on the television, all you see about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in this country and over um, on Turtle Island and in our countries over there, all you see about Indian children is how they're failing school, how they're running amok, how the parents are alcoholics or child abusers. You know, the bulk of the media that we see on the television in our newspapers, if we see ourselves in the newspapers um, or in our magazines is deficit narratives. And yet those of us, you know, coming from the communities we come from, we know that that is only a part of the story. And that in fact is an impact of this oppression and colonization that we've survived. But there's a much stronger and a much more powerful story that William was talk talking about and that we were guided with the elders from this particular communities that we worked in um, of strength and resilience and resistance. And that informed the desire to tell this story and to make this story. That's really where it came out of. There are lots of other stories around this film, including a, you know, the other director, I mean, the director, Maya Newell, and the other producers and our long-term relationships with family. But ultimately this story comes out of the community themselves, a desire to see that on screen, which is why you know, it was so wonderful yeah. to involve as a project. Um, yeah, the, the entire film too, um, throws up many facets, many different aspects of how um, uh, people are treated in Australia. Um, the classic example of him standing on the hill and he can see the affluent society on one side of the hill and looking down on his little town camp and see the amenities that they have and he didn't have and the difference in housing and, and the way that things were set out. And, the amount of money that goes into uh, the golf course estate as opposed to Hidden um, Town Camp, Hidden Valley Town Camp. And that's the way that things have always been historically, is that second rate treatment and second rate consideration in regards to the traditional owners of this land. And that's the way that they've been treated at, uh, for millennium for quite some time. Um, also, the the fact that unknown to a lot of viewers probably is that this hidden agenda that um, grandmother and uh, the uh, Megan, the mother, were well aware of that um, behind the, the, the corner was this ever present threat of being taken away, being uh, consumed by the uh, detention centres being consumed uh, by um, uh, ultimately the prison systems. And it's a conveyor belt that uh, if you fall foul of it, you could end up um, doing quite a few years in prison uh, purely based on the um, colour of your skin. And so, you know, our prisons are in the Northern Territory are 90% uh, full of uh, um, Indigenous people and the juvenile detention centres are 100% uh, juvenile youth. And you can see the way the way that system is set up to catch people out, especially on school attendance and um, you, you get your income um, uh, means tested and, and ultimately uh, deducted. And so people are then forced into a situation of poverty and 
you could see Duan was clever enough to realize, um, yes, he was missing school, but he was missing it for a reason. It, did, it didn't apply to him. He didn't understand it. He couldn't, couldn't um, see it, and he knew that it was wrong. And ultimately, he could have ended up on that um, uh, conveyor belt into prisons. But he came to a crossroads in his life, and um, one one of the roads ended up in Dondale, and the other one ended up in Geneva. And I'm glad he took the one to Geneva, which is um, where the family had taken him, and um, and it was them that stepped in and it took agency in their lives and decided that, yes, we, we need to uh, send him off to his father, to his father's country, to his father's culture, to his father's language, and ultimately um, the foundation that he grows up with, which all of us have, um, is, is uh, a lot stronger. Um, assimilation was the policy of yesteryear and uh, assimilation was all about uh, tearing up that foundation, fragmenting it to all points of the compass, uh, the years of the stolen generation, you name it. Um, it was all about assimilation. Uh, you will assimilate and, and that's the way it's gonna be, otherwise you end up in the prison system. And um, it's forced assimilation in every aspect of the word. So Rachel, if you wanna, or anyone no. else? <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, that, that's right. That, was that, that context, you know, of how the film sat and why it was important to bring this. I mean, I, I think also, um, you know, there's an opportunity that a child's voice has to cut through a lot of the, a lot of the noise and a lot of the chatter and remind us of the impact that these policies and these systems that govern our communities without our voices guiding them and guiding their direction and guiding their pedagogy. It, it's, it's an opportunity for a child's voice to remind us of how important it is that that agency be returned to our communities because that really is the only way to, um, you know, that is the only proven way and it's the only way and it's the only way people all across the world of most communities I've been in know to really positively start to impact and start to heal from these um, histories that we've all survived um, and start to revitalize and start to build ourselves back off of a strength based rather than a deficit based and rather than in response to something um, building it, you know, based off of the foundations that we've carried for, you know, eons. And our people so that that was you know the hope was with this film that by letting people see the world through dawn's perspective and by having the community guide even the way that we did the film how we did every as every single aspect of the film that we would get an authentic um pers an authentic perspective into the story and that that authentic perspective would would stir people to want to see to want to push for systemic change across these areas i think that as I watched this film, and this is my second time watching it, that there's definitely overlap in what's happening over here. And in that being Indigenous Peoples Day, I really wondered if there's any ideas you had about how Indigenous peoples, how we can support each other. Yeah, I, I, I too totally agree with that and uh, the similarities and um, the way that colonization uh, happened was very, very similar in every way, every sense of the word. And uh, it was all about um, making us all turn into um, an assimilated people, um, westernizing us, Christianizing us, I don't know about homogenizing or pasteurizing, but they nearly did. Um, but you know, that's the way it was. and. Um, that's the way that uh, colonization progressed. And the key to it is never let go of who you are. Never let go of who you really are, your identity, your language, your culture, your land, your family. And Duan picked that up very quickly and very philosophically in, in the way that he said, I have a memory. I have a memory. And in, that, in, in those words, just those little words, he summed it up in one sense that he had this innate ability to see himself as an Aboriginal, to feel it, to know it, to dream it. He was Aboriginal and he was going to hold on to that 
and he still wants to hold on to that today. He didn't want to lose that. But as I said earlier, the simulation was all about taking that away from you. It was all about wiping that out, that feeling, that dreaming, that meaning, that whatever it was, you know, our memory. He will take, they will take that away from you. And I'm really, really sort of proud now in regards to DeWine that not only does he have his mother's and his grandmother's uh, stories and culture and interconnectedness with land, country, language and family down here, but he also now has strengthened that by having his grandfather and his father's, the, you know, their connection to country. Um, he's just going to grow up with a stronger foundation than a lot of us have ever, ever, ever had. And that's a good thing. I think that's a beautiful um, context to answer that question. And I think, you know, I, I spend having sat in in-between spaces for so much of my professional life after starting to kind of travel the world and being invited into other communities to work. I, I've been so lucky and privileged to be to learn other people and learn and see other other ways of being and, and be invited into other communities and learn from other elders around the world. And it's a be beautiful question that I spend so much time thinking about because I really feel that, you know, our experiences of oppression and our experiences of colonization and experiences of assimilation, um, although different to each of our contexts and have different points, the, the impacts are often very similar. Our communities are all suffering from very, very similar things and our communities are all asking for the same thing. And so, you know, in my other hat, I do a lot of work um, in in-between spaces between systems and organizations and communities uh, in the kind of cultural safety aspect. And I think that uh, coming together as indigenous people to start to share our own stories to start to find a recharge. Like often I think we need to find ways to recharge in the battles that we face in our individual work in our individual spaces, because it's so much that we're trying to hold up. And sometimes that recharge and reminding ourselves that our strength is actually on our own country and our own grounding, you know, these things that we have in common and finding other people, you know, I often say it's like, it's like looking sideways, you know, we're all looking this way to try to hold something up to try to put out these fires. And it sometimes can feel very, lonely and you can feel very much like um, there's like three of us here in my community trying to do this and sometimes when we open that up and look beyond just our own individual communities our own individual borders you go oh my gosh there's a whole bunch of other people and we're all actually fighting this same battle and actually there's a potential there for us to link up and give power to each other because you know we're also sometimes very small <laughs> very discrete locations but together we make up a huge force and a huge population who are all actually even though the battles are different and these contexts are different and sometimes what we're asking is different what we're all asking for is the system and the bias be recognized right that we adjust the bias in the system and we start to drive and control the systems that govern our own people, whether their health, whether their education, whether their arts and film, whether it's land management, whatever it is, we resource manage it, that that agency should rest with our own people. And those two things, you know, calling for an understanding that there's a systemic bias that is still impacting us, this history of colonization is not ended, right? Those two things give us this amazing ability to unite over that and to support each other, to call for these fundamental rights and to remind ourselves that actually this is something, you know, that we are still standing like this and fighting, fighting this way, but actually, you know, we're standing on top of our own strength and our own grounding and on top of, you know, with the backing of all of our elders who've held that space, right? Like it's to kind of remove the colonial you know thought process in your head that somehow we lost it and we're fighting to get it back we've actually maintained it in every single community i've been in we have held that our elders there's a pocket of elders and a pocket of people and resistance fighters who who have an incredible resilience who've held that and the one of the beautiful things about this project is you look at Duan and you go you're the next generation of that. And there's something lovely in being able to see that and being able to feel that passed down. And when you have children, you can see it in your children. And in fact, if you, you know, for me, I look at my children, I see my grandchildren, I see my great grandchildren, and I can see how 
the longevity of what I'm doing is not just, you know, what I'm doing right now, because there's a lot of things we're not going to see in our immediate life. We have to look further out to see those changes. So I think that um, to your question, and it's a long answer to your question, and we're really, William and I are both really um, looking forward to hearing from the other panelists and how this lands in your context. Um, but to answer your question, I think those are the two things that can draw us together. And there's an incredible strength in unity. If I've learned, you know, one of the key things I learned from my own community is that tiny little groups of us can accomplish amazing things if we can stand on a unified platform. That is beautiful. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate all the thought you put into that question because it's a tricky question. And both of you, thank you so much for your time. Now we're gonna move to the Arizona panelists and I'd, I'm gonna kind of call out your names and I'd like you to introduce yourselves um, in the same manner um, that makes you feel comfortable um, starting with, I'm just going per my window, starting with Amy. University of Arizona. Um, Good day, everyone. Good evening. My name is Amy Lynn Spotterwolf, and I come from the Fresno County community in the Babakibi District um, in the Donaldum Nation, which is located in southern Arizona along the border of the United States and Mexico. Um, I am a senior at the University of Arizona, and I study elementary education. So, and I'm a teacher candidate from the Indigenous Teacher Education Project, which is led by Jeremy Garcia. <laughs> Um, who's also in the panel. So thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm really excited for this conversation. And um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tony? Leo Sanchi Manuel, Cachamalea, Inepo Tony Viola Tea. Greetings, everyone. My name is Tony Viola. I'm Yoeme and a first year doctoral student at the University of Arizona in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Sociocultural Studies. And I look forward to being able to share some virtual community with you all and answer some questions together. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Maria? <laughs> Hello, Leo Sanchi Maniavo, Kachamalea, Inapo Maria Molina, Vaisa Waitea. Um, just want to thank you all for this opportunity. Um, thank you just for giving us, giving me the space to be able to come and share with you all and just share some thoughts and love and everything that we have to offer. Um, right now, I, I'm a clinical social, uh, social worker. I work over for the Paswayaki tribe. Right now, I'm managing the men's inpatient residential treatment home that we have. I also teach out of Pima Community College, the social and through the social work behavioral health department. Um, like Melody, no, Patricia mentioned earlier, I'm married. I have six children. Um, I'm part of the Tlamanalca community here, part of Calpoli del Chicali. And so that's kind of what I want to be able to speak on behalf of today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Jeremy. Hi, good evening. Hi. Um, it's nice to be here and to uh, engage in conversation. And, and I think it's got a lot of uh, deep purpose and meaning. So um, I am faculty at the University of Arizona in the Department of Teaching and Learning and Social Culture Studies. Uh, also a member of the Hopi Tewa community, which is located in the northern eastern corner of the state of Arizona. So um, I look forward to, to what unfolds here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So the first question I have is, which part of this film really resonated the most with you that you'd like to share? And just unmute and go for it. <laughs> I love it when they're shy. Okay, Amy, you're laughing the most, so I'm gonna pick on you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I was trying to do the head nod to Tony. So you go for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my, um, thank you for the question. My, the part that stood out to me most um, was about, or was when Dequan, 
the one was in the classrooms, um, interacting with the teachers. Um, as a teacher myself, I was thinking about, um, I was noticing uh, the one's behavior in class um, when he was learning about, um, you know, English, like the settlers, um, the basically the colonization of, of, of Australia, he was like, not interested, didn't really care. Um, other stuff like when it had to do with English or um, other kinds of, or other subjects, um, he wasn't all that interested. Um, but when he was interested and when he was paying attention was when he was learning the language, when he was hearing a story about dreams and the spirit. And he even told this teacher, the spirit is real, you know, like that was something that really meant a lot to him. Um, so that's what I was really taking notice, um, was taking notice to. And as a teacher, as an indigenous teacher for indigenous students, I, um, you know, I, I notice that and I, and I see the importance of teaching indigenous students um, with their own indigenous knowledge um, so that they can, you know, they can use that to work work in this system, you know, work in this, um, in this society, um, but have that cultural influence, like it, like it's still in school and it's still there. And um, it just needs to be brought out more so that these kids can be more engaged in class and more excited to learn about what's going on in school. Um, and just more excited to attend, you know, um, and we, and we notice that at the end when he's at school with an indigenous teacher teaching his indigenous language, he's listening, he's doing his work and he's going to school and he, um, and, and that's what we want for our indigenous students. That's what we want for them. And um, so, and I, I think kind of going back to your question for, for um, William and Rachel, um, about what indigenous people can do for indigenous, other indigenous people is just to uh, learn to teach each other, learn to learn to um, use our cultural knowledge to teach our kids so that they can um, continue, they can continue their traditions, they can continue to um, be excited about school and, um, and just, Keep them and keep them away from that um, pipeline to prison and or conveyor belt to prison, as Mr. As Mr. William <coughs> explained. Um, and those those ideas those ideas will help the the students and the indigenous students in the long run. Um, yeah, that's my <laughs> my answer. Thank you. Thank you. I have to admit, I was absolutely stunned when I saw that scene. I thought that teacher did that on camera and allowed that image, that just blows my mind. Um, so I understand the impact of that particular scene. We also have a comment from Alicia, who also um, just said that, that the teacher and Rosemary, they're talking about as, as teachers, how upsetting that scene was for them. And you know, the importance of indigenous education. So, um, I guess I'm gonna call names unless I see an unmute real fast. Maria, yes, can you tell us about what part of the film resonated with you and why? So it's hard because I know we don't have a lot of time to, so I'm gonna try to, to pick out a, a few of the things because I feel like it all goes together. So definitely, um, you know, I kind of had the same thought about what, you know, what Amy was talking about being in the classroom because I remember being a kid in a classroom and I raised six children going through school and being in a classroom and I've sat in college classrooms and it's always the same thing, you know. Um, Elder William talked about things being prescribed to us and us just having to live there, live there in that space and not having, uh, you know, that, that safe space to be able to identify with who we are and express who we are. And so I was thinking about how there, there was a point early on in the movie when one of the teachers was talking about the true history of our country, right? And I noticed that he raised his hand and 
it, I don't know if he, they didn't call on him or if they just didn't show it in the film, but they don't call on us, you know? And in fact, when we do start talking and, and because I've had to go talk to, to my students, teachers multiple times about them being shut out by them being told, no, that's not true by so many, so many different things that I, I, I wouldn't have enough time to tell you were just completely inappropriate and microaggressions, right? For our little children to be experiencing in school. And so I, I wondered to myself, like, what was his question or what was he gonna say? Because, you know, he really represented the counter narrative. You know, I, I think what was so amazing and fascinating about him that at such a young age, he, he had so much wisdom, you know, and, and everything that he thought and everything that he believed, you know, he, re he really kind of showed that and, and his, be you know, what we see the negative impacts of, of colonialism and what happens in the school. We saw him struggling through that, but he had this insight that was able to, to keep him well, you know, and he had a what, what's amazing to me that I think that I, I miss, I know that I missed and I worry that my kids will miss and I've seen other people miss is that he has a really clear vision for himself and his future. And that's not really common when we are talking about the impacts of colonialism and, and generational trauma, but he had that as something that he really saw um, for, him, for himself. And so um, I know I don't have a lot of time, but I think, um, you know, when he talked about, um, he talked about his healing medicine, his energy, and he was saying that when he's in the bush, it's like a straight line, but when you go into town, it gets wobbly, and I feel like that's us, you know, I, I feel like this, that's us, and I feel like he said so many wise things about just our survival and our existence and our resistance, and pretty much I felt like what he was saying was land back when he said it's wobbly land back, you know? And, and so I, I really, it was just amazing. You know, I, that's what I want for my kids, you know, because there's so many times that for, as a parent, I've heard my children and like when, when uh, grandma was teaching the song and then he said, can you do it in English? Her face was that face that I know all of us have had when our kids will be like, you know, they fuss sometimes or they don't feel like it sometimes. And we all kind of have that feeling, you know, but then I also uh, another thing that really stood out to me is just how he was able to say the way that we get these white people off of our land is by learning their ways. You know, we pretty much we learn their ways and use them, that, them against them, you know, and I feel like this is what we're doing. We wouldn't be here if we didn't know this technology, if we didn't, you know, have access to the things that we have today and that we're actually living out that reality that he saw. And so, yeah, I, it, I can go on and on about it because there was so many powerful things about the film, but yeah, that kid is, is amazing. I agree as a parent, that movie kind of cuts to a whole different core of you. And I definitely saw um, different family members and my children in different places in that movie. I relate. And that face you said with that grandma made, oh, I've gotten that face. So I'm sorry, I was laughing. I think I even snorted into the camera. I'm so sorry, audience, but I have gotten that face. So um, I just really understand what you were saying. So Tony, would you like to share which part of the movie resonated with you and why? Of course. So what really resonated with me was the way that the filmmakers and community leaders incorporated the historical context or narrative throughout the film as the story unfolds, uh, mainly because today non-Indigenous educators and policymakers are very quick to critique the contemporary status of Indigenous students by viewing them as separate or far from the historical praxis of settler colonialism. Um, so when he's got his bad grades in the film and started doubting his intelligence and asking like, is there something wrong with me? Uh, that hit very deep because I feel like most of us have been there before, but a lot of indigenous youth continue to when they're searching for, the, for those answers as Rachel mentioned from that deficit or negative approach, either on a community level or individual. Um, in reality, I just wanna grab everyone and tell them like it's just the impacts of this education system working as it was designed to. Uh, so specifically within the context of the United States, 
to everyone who is non-native and wants to support native students that actually looks like grounding yourself in the history of Indian education, but also the history and the culture of the people that you want to work with. So that history, although everyone views it as past and gone, is actually very much important in the future. And I love how that was incorporated in the film, amongst many other things, as we all talked about, a lot of it hit home and resonated. I agree. Jeremy, did you want to hold off to the end? I know you're closing us out, or would you like to jump in right now? Uh, I can I can hold out. Yeah, that's fine. I'll okay. wait. I just, I'm thinking of the, the broader sort of uh, synthesis for myself, but I, I can, yeah, let's, I'm open to having some conversation and dialogue, and then I'll offer some comments. I didn't want the audience to think that I'm ignoring anybody. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a closing question for our Arizona panelists, which is the same thing that I just asked um, William and Rachel. And that is, how can indigenous people support each other better? Well, I'll, I'll go first, but um, what, what astounds me here is that um, the fluency of language that you guys have. I'm quite envious actually, because I come from the Stalin generation and I was put on a mission where my language wasn't spoken. My family uh, were a thousand kilometers away. Um, I spent 10 years on that mission and learning nothing but uh, religion and uh, Western, um, Western uh, education. And um, as a result of that, I struggle now even to this day uh, to talk fluently in, in my language. And um, I'm amazed and I'm quite extremely proud to hear the fluency that goes on here because it, it, it's another uh, uh, string in the bow if you want to look at it in that way that um, we have, we have language. Language is the glue that holds everything together. And too often our people buy the story of assimilation and off they go trudging off to be politicians and lawyers and judges or whatever they want. And very soon that connection is, is broken and, and broken uh, uh, to the extent that it's very hard to rebuild. And um, that's, that's what assimilation is designed to do. And you're forever in a day asking, who am I? Who, where do I come from? Where do I fit in? And it, even if there's room for me. And that's, a, that's something that those people have to grapple with every day. But they're the ones that um, work very closely with uh, governments. They're the ones that work very closely to create hybrids of what is called culturally appropriate. But I think these, these sort of discussions, just to answer your question, there's plenty of room to work together. And I agree with that. Thank you. Mm. Who would like to go next? <laughs> I killed the subject, I think. <laughs> <laughs> We're just in awe of everything you had to say. We're kind of soaking it in. But Tony raised his hand, so go ahead, Tony. Yeah, um, I think to support Indigenous communities, there's a lot of internal things we need to address. Uh, a lot of it has pitted us against each other in more ways than we think. And it, this takes shapes in multiple forms. So it might be the drift between like urban natives or rural natives and how that's turned us against each other or who we think is classified as a true native. But also there's tons of anti-blackness and homophobia that's been implanted into our communities. Um, so there's a lot of relearning or unlearning that needs to go on for us to be able to move forward because a lot of these ideas weren't original to our peoples, but they're very much the struggle and energy that we're fighting over now when it wasn't even originating with us to begin with. So I think there's a lot of internal reflection and education that needs to happen. Sweet. Yes, we've, we've got to decolonize our minds, I think. <laughs> Absolutely, Maria? It's hard to come up with an answer because everybody says all the smart things. <laughs> 
No, I mean, yeah, I agree with with everything that everyone said so far, you know, just really, you know, when after I watched the movie, and we were going to watch it today before the, um, the panel, I had my kids watch it, you know, and, and I think those things are really important, because they need to be able to experience and understand that this is like a global thing, you know, and that to, to, and in a way to be empowered, right, and for them to understand that they're not alone. And, and yeah, definitely, like in between group conflict, and then like, even within group conflict about, you know, let's not question each other's um, validity as Indigenous people, you know, when we do know our lineages, let's love one another. Um, you know, I, I was like, really irritated in the movie when the teacher said, um, let's, it's a coloring activity, you know, uh, that really, it pissed me off. I'm sorry for this. That's not a problem. It pissed me off because like, it's like the kids go to school, the kids are being forced to assimilate and, you know, to be white thinkers, you know, and, and to live and be that way. And it's, it's a joke. It's a facade. They don't want us there. They don't want to include us there, you know, and, and it's like, they're laughing at us, you know, and, and we have to remember that when, when as parents and as educators that if we're in the school and we see another native kid, let's look out for them. You know, we have to look out for, for one another. We have to make sure that the, the children are being treated in a respectful way. Let's introduce ourselves to each other, our, our kids to each other and introduce ourselves to each other because um, I think sometimes we forget and, and, and I understand that we're all in survival morph mode for the majority of the time, but we have to remember just to extend our, our hearts and love one another this, the way that we were taught to, you know, um, to be loving, to be accepting and together as one global community of indigenous people, as caretakers of the earth and of the water and of the future generations, let's raise our children together and let's raise our communities together. You know, I just ask a, one quick comment. Um, in regards to ancient practices, and a lot of you would have seen uh, the lighting of fires and burning, over here, it was called fire stick farming, uh, where the land was burnt off, green shoots would come up, um, animals would come in, and then you would have, you'd be able to hunt a lot more in, in that environment. But it was also a prevention of bushfires. Um, so in the end, what you're seeing is the ancient ways uh, would be mo become more and more apparent in this world that we've messed up. It become more and more apparent and, and obvious that these systems did work and that the world, the way the industrial world has changed the globe, uh, it needs to be undone. And some of those old cultural practices need to come back to the fore. Sorry about that, I just butted in on there. Mm. No, we appreciate everything that you're sharing with us. We have a question from the audience. Um, we only have time for one or two of these questions. If anyone's interested to answer, do you think it is possible to have a single institution where a teacher can teach to students of, of a wide variety of backgrounds? Um, they gave some context, but would anyone like to tackle that question? Uh, sure, I would like to. Awesome. Um, so when we think about institutions teaching um, our students like a wide variety of backgrounds, um, something we learn at the uh, College of Education is about, um, oh, no, I just lost it, um, funds of knowledge. Funds of knowledge where um, people are, we take in consideration of all of our students, where they come from, who their family is um, and use that to teach them <laughs> um, just like um, and because with their food um, excuse me I'm sorry <laughs> I'm really I get nervous it's um, late it's okay I get more nervous on zoom than I do in person <laughs> it's weird <laughs> um, so with the funds of knowledge um, we we build off of their experience, off of students' experiences. And um, like with the, 
if we were to look back on the, the film when the teacher was reading the book, she could have went so deep into what he had to say about his funds and knowledge. What is, he said that the spirit is real. Okay, what does that mean to, what does the spirit mean to you? Um, does anybody else know know about the spirit or who who is the spirit, you know? Talking to these students and asking about their background knowledge, the experiences that they've all had and bringing that to the forefront and using that to, using that to teach the rest of the students and, um, and it also just makes the student feel happy that they're being acknowledged, their experiences are being acknowledged. Because like um, Maria had said, like, imagine how he felt when the teacher just totally blew him off about, and after he said, um, the spirit is real, you know, and he raised his hand. Like, uh, imagine how he felt. That's like, we shouldn't put that on our, on our students. And um, I think that um, just building from uh, funds and knowledge will help the will help schools and help educators uh, uh, be better teachers for um, all students from all different backgrounds. Thank you so much, Amy, Jeremy. Thank you, everyone. Jeremy would like to close us out, so please do so. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks to each of you for sharing your thoughts and responses. Uh, I had, I too had similar reactions and um, uh, it generated and triggered a lot of emotions, but also deep reflection about the the significance of the work that we have to do as indigenous peoples and and, and members of our communities, but also um, the the layers of accountability that that come to fruition in this work and the the ideas of solidarity. I think this very moment is an example of solidarity by engaging in dialogue and sharing responses to, to what we all just engaged in and, and, and went through. But I do wanna recognize and give thanks uh, to Rachel and Elder William. And if you're able to share uh, my, my thoughts with the family, with Duan, if you're still in communication with them, that I, I appreciate them opening their doors. We know that as indigenous peoples to do something like that, to have your a camera following you, we know that that's also got some problems when we engage with research, right? Um, but to allow them to be able to capture the very specific nuances and, and points of frustration and tension um, in understanding how they navigate schooling spaces and, and the way that policy and systemic processes are actually in the household. And you can see it clearly throughout the film. And I thought that um, it resonates probably with so many of our indigenous communities because they can see, we can see ourselves in that space. We can see the, the tension that they're navigating. And I wanna hone in on, on, on Duan. And I think that one of the broader things that like just kind of captures everything about him is that uh, to draw on my, my uh, 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 indigenous scholar, Diné scholar, um, who utilized this term of critical indigenous consciousness. And he does have a cultural and critical indigenous consciousness as young as he is. And he does that in so many ways. And I think, for example, you start out, uh, Elder William, you acknowledge that he, in the very beginning, they're standing at the mountain and right there, they're naming class structures. They're naming the, the dis, uh, uh, proportionate uh, inequitable circumstances with the housing and, and the distribution of funding and so forth. So they recognize clearly what's happening. He recognizes that. But he's also, I think, unpacking in that moment and throughout many other spaces, the, the distinctions in the value systems, uh, his relationship to land versus funding versus money. So he does that in very powerful uh, ways that I think reflect this idea that he has a very strong critical consciousness about what is happening within uh, the context of his community and what has happened. The other piece to this is the history that those several moments where he's engaging in conversation with his grandmother, his aunts and the elders about the history of removal. And that there is probably something that will never be reflected in the textbooks in the schooling spaces. And then he goes into the, uh, the conversations about they want us to be like them, they want us to act like them. So there he's already teasing out in very uh, complex ways, the, the, the process of, of colonialism and its impact. But I also wanna give attention to that, his consciousness about his role as a healer. And I think that deserves a lot of, of recognition. I think that um, talk about pressure, uh, talk about pressure of sustaining his community. And he gets it when he's talking about this idea of 
you know, if, if someone gets you mad, you can get them sick because he understands the power that he, that he, that is invested in him as a young healer. And I was sitting there thinking, and I thought, well, that, that idea of who is getting him mad, and it is really the schooling system. It is the welfare system that is creating this sort of anxiety and anger that disrupts his, his ability to probably potentially focus on his role as a healer and the power within that. But I, I just value that, the, the, that his ability to navigate space and to be able to be fully conscious about the ways in which he's doing that. So that would be, you know, I just, I think that this, this film and, and what you all have brought and what they have gifted us to create this dialogue, I think is, is critical uh, for means of creating uh, ideas around solidarity uh, in terms of coming together, because I think there is a shared narrative and counter narratives, as I think Maria uh, mentioned that that are happening here. So I just want to express my deep gratitude to the family, to Rachel, to Elder William for sharing sharing their narrative with us. And I, 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 I really think that there is a lot of hope in terms of the agency that Duran will carry with him. Thanks. Thank you all so much. Perfect timing. Everybody, it was a real pleasure facilitating this amazing conversation. I do want to share that Rachel did put in the chat that if anyone would like to send something back to the community from the film, they can visit www.inmyblooditruns.com slash take action. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your comments. Please fill out the survey uh, when you get it in your email tomorrow. Have a lovely evening. And in Australia, have a lovely day. Thank you. Good night.